I want us to continue speaking about the foundational doctrines of Christianity. Today we're going to look at the doctrine of the laying on of hands found in Hebrews chapter 6. Verses 1 and 2. It's interesting that one of the foundational principles of the Christian faith is a doctrine regarding the laying on of hands. Does anybody find it particularly interesting besides myself? We have the doctrine of salvation, which is repentance from dead works. We have the doctrine of faith, which we can understand. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We have the doctrine of baptisms, which again we understand. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the body of Jesus, the baptism in water, and the baptism of suffering. But then you have this doctrine, the laying on of hands. And it just seems so out of place. It seems so kind of peculiar. I mean, can there possibly be a doctrine and if there is a doctrine, which obviously there must be because it's in the Bible, it's part of the, the doctrines that the apostles taught, what is it? And why is it important? Now, for those who have been to every single session, which is the far minority of the people gathered here today, as is the custom of modern-day Christianity, there's a pattern. Right? There's a pattern in these doctrines that emulates the pattern of the feasts of Israel. And what is interesting about the doctrine of the laying on of the hands is it follows on of the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is a type of the feast of weeks. But I don't want to go into that because I'm going to just confuse everybody. Suffice to say this, that in the Old Testament, the feasts were broken up into two sets, which most of you know by now. You had the spring feasts, that's the feast of Passover, Pesach, feast of first fruits, sorry, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. And then you have the autumn feasts, which begin with the Feast of Trumpets, which is the typology of the rapture. The Lord will descend with the sound of the trumpet, and the dead in Christ will rise. Speaking of the rapture. So, we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which corresponds to the Feast of Weeks, and then we have the doctrine of the laying on of hands, and then the next doctrine is the resurrection of the dead. Which is like the rapture. the rapture. Is anybody on the same page yet? All right. Or do you need a cup of coffee just to kind of wake up? But this is fascinating. Because once the rapture takes place, that's it. It's all over. By the wrath of God, pain, suffering, screaming, shouting, people wishing to die and not dying, and all that wonderful stuff. That foreshadows the millennial reign of Jesus. But coming back to the doctrines, we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of water, etc., etc., and then we have the doctrine of laying out of hands, and then after that, the resurrection of the dead, which tells me something, that the doctrine of the laying on of hands has got something to do with the outworking of the baptism in the Holy Spirit until the resurrection of the dead, which is the rapture. So basically, to simplify it, if you're not on the same wavelength, let me just Simplify it. Until Jesus returns, we're going to have to function in the doctrine of the laying on of hands, which is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Are you getting a vague picture of that? All right, there's types and shadows. Let's look at this doctrine. Let's go right back and study it out of the Old Testament to understand it and then see how it was practiced in the New Testament and how we observe or live out this doctrine under the new. So those of you who got your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 48. Genesis, the first book of the Old Testament. Chapter 48, and we're going to 
look very briefly at the account of Jacob blessing the two sons of Joseph, Manasseh the eldest and Ephraim the younger. Now the Bible tells us if we Look at verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father is sick. And he took with him his twin sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And the Bible says, And Jacob was told, Look, your sons, your son Joseph is coming to you. Now I want you to notice the change in the, the name. And Israel strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. For those of you who know your Old Testament, you know that Jacob, the, th the third patriarch, the grandson of Abraham, the son of Isaac, was called Jacob, which means supplanter or deceiver. And that was the name he went by. And that was the character of his life. He deceived his brother out of a birthright. He deceived his uncle Laban out of flocks of goats, and finally he encounters a Christophany, that is a example of Jesus in the Old Testament at the river Jabbok, where he wrestles with an angel whose name is Wonderful. And he wrestles with this angel. It's a type of a wrestling with God dealing with your character, because the angel cries out to him and says, what is your name? And he cries out, deceiver. <laughs> that's who I am. I'm a deceiver. It's my name and that's who I am. And the angel turns around and says, because you have wrestled with God, not with an angel, with God, and you have prevailed, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, deceiver, but Yisrael, it's made up, the word Yisrael or Israel is made up of two words. One is overcomer, and the other, El, is an abbreviation for Elohim or God. One who has wrestled with God and overcome. It could be translated prince with God, an overcomer with God. And so here it is Israel who is going to bless the sons of Joseph. Oftentimes you read the Old Testament, God will refer to Israel as Jacob. And that's when Israel are in disobedience. He then calls them Jacob. When Israel are serving God and are following after God, he calls them Israel. That's, why is that important? We'll see later on. And so Joseph brings his two sons for the patriarchal blessing. This was very much part of the culture of the patriarchs and throughout the Old Testament, that they sought the blessing of the fathers. The blessing that God gave to Abraham, Abraham gave that to Isaac. Isaac, in turn, gave the same blessing to Jacob. He thought it was Esau, but Jacob stole the blessing. And when Esau wanted to be blessed by his father, he could not. So there was something very special about the patriarchal blessing. And the Bible says, we'll take up from verse 5. Well, let's just take it up for sake of time. We all know that God, sorry, uh, Joseph wants his father to bless his sons. So we'll, for sake of time... We're going to take it from verse 12. So Joseph brought them from beside his knees. That's his two sons, Manasseh, the eldest, Ephraim, the younger. According to the culture and tradition, the eldest son gets the double portion, gets the double blessing. That is the custom. And so the Bible says that Joseph brings the boys from his, beside his knees, and he bowed down with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand toward Israel's left hand. Now there's something important about left and right. The right hand in the Bible always speaks about the hand of blessing, the hand of strength. 
And so when you were praying for somebody or two people, in this case, the right hand would always go upon the eldest because that is the hand of double blessing and the left hand would go on the youngest according to tradition and culture. The Bible says that Joseph took them both and he leads Ephraim the younger with his right hand towards Israel's left hand. And Manasseh the elder, he leads with his left hand towards Israel's right hand and he brings them near. Then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on, the, on Ephraim's head. So the right hand goes upon the wrong child. It goes upon the younger. Just like with Jacob, his father's right hand of blessing went upon him, the younger, and not Esau, the elder. And then, as the Bible says, so he lays it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head guarding his hands knowingly. Jacob knows what he's doing. For Manasseh was the firstborn. And so he speaks out the patriarchal blessing. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has led me all my life, long, as, long to this day, the angel has redeemed me from all evil. Notice the word God, angel, interchangeable. But in your Bibles, the angel should be with a capital A, speaking of Jesus. Bless the lads, that my name be named upon them, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And notice now Joseph's response. So verse 17 says, Now when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Now the Bible's already told us that Jacob's eyesight was failing him. Just like his father's eyesight, Isaac, failed him. And Jacob stole the blessing because of his father's poor eyesight. Jacob knows a thing or two about blessing people in your old age where you don't see so good. And he's knowingly placing the double blessing on the younger. Joseph, of course, is saying, Father, you're getting this wrong. Why on earth was Joseph so frantic? I mean, if he's just laying hands, that's all he's doing. He's just putting his hands on the boys and speaking a blessing. I mean, really, it's not a big deal. I mean, we... we we have people lay hands on us. It's really not a big deal. I mean, if God wants to do something, He will. If He doesn't, He doesn't. It's no big deal to us in the modern church. And that's because we don't understand the spiritual significance of laying on of hands when a believer, one who has the Spirit of God upon them, lays hands on another. There is incredible blessing that is transferred. This was known to the Jews. This was known to the patriarchs. It was known to Moses and the children of Israel and has been generally forgotten by the church today. You can read the rest of the account for yourselves. But the blessing that God, sorry, that that. Jacob spoke over Ephraim, came to pass. He would become a greater tribe than Manasseh. In fact, so great that the northern kingdom of Israel, comprising of the ten tribes that broke away from Yehuda and Benjamin, were called Ephraim. And Manasseh, who was the eldest, became subservient to the tribe of Ephraim. So the blessing that Jacob speaks over these two children, generations into the future, comes to pass. Detailed, fulfilling the details of Jacob's blessing, which you can read for yourself. Under the Old Testament, hands were laid upon people and upon animals for two purposes. Would you like to see? All right, we'll read the Old Testament and you'll find them. All right, let's go to Leviticus chapter 4. You're in Genesis, 
The next book is Exodus and then Leviticus chapter 4. And we're going to look at one of the sacrifices instructed in the law of Moses, Leviticus chapter 4, the sin offering. And we'll read from verse 1. Now it might sound a bit gory to you. No, that comes a bit later. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel saying, If a person sins unintentionally against any of the commandments of the Lord in anything which ought not to be done and does any of them, if the anointed priest sins bringing guilt on the people, then let him offer to the Lord for his sin, which he has sinned a young bull without blemish as a sin offering. He shall bring the bull to the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, lay his hand on the bull's head and kill the bull before the Lord. If you go down to verse 13, now if the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally, and the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done something against any of the commandments of the Lord in anything which should not be done and are guilty, when the sin which they have sinned becomes known, then the assembly shall offer a young bull for the sin and bring it before the tabernacle of meeting, and the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands on the head of the bull before the Lord, then the bull shall be killed before the Lord. And elsewhere in the scriptures, the Bible tells us the same thing under the law of Moses. For the scapegoat, for the day of atonement, the priest will lay his hand upon the scapegoat. And the Bible says he will place upon the scapegoat the sins of Israel. And so in a act of obedience, God transferred the sin as we saw in the fourth chapter of Leviticus, the sin of the high priest will be transferred upon the bull. The sin of, the, of Israel, the unintentional sin through the laying on of hands will be placed upon the bull. So God would, through this act of ceremony, He would transfer from one to the other. So we see hands were laid to bring atonement. The sin of Israel, Either the priest or an individual or, an, or the nation would be transferred from the nation onto the animal. And that's exactly what happened with Jesus. The Bible says he, God made him who knew, knew no sin to be sin for us. Now there are those in the church who don't understand the scripture. And they say Jesus took on our sin and was fooled with our sin on the cross. That's not what the Bible teaches what the Bible teaches is that he became the scapegoat. He became the representation of our sin. He was not himself a sinner, but the sin was placed upon him. He himself never became sinful, or otherwise he would be an imperfect sacrifice. I mean, you think about it. He had to be a perfect lamb. He couldn't become sinful at the last minute. And so, just like under the Old Testament where the bull or the scapegoat became a symbol of the sin because the sin had been transferred. How? Through the laying on of hands. There was a transfer. Did the high priest literally transfer the sin? No. It was an act of God. He just obediently would lay hands on the animal. So for there's that's one Example of the laying on of hands. It is the transferring of the guilt of an individual or of a nation upon a sacrificial animal. And it's a typology of Jesus bearing the sins of the guilty while he himself remained righteous. You can take a reference in Leviticus chapter 24, verse 10 through 15. In a court case, the witnesses against an accused would have to lay hands on the accused to witness that what they have seen is the truth and that his guilt is upon them. If he's innocent, then they've accused incorrectly an innocent man and then the judgment goes back onto them. But in Numbers chapter 27, the second... So we see that hands were laid to transfer guilt from one party to another. That's the first reason 
or purpose of the laying on of hands under the Old Testament for the transferring of guilt or sin from one party to the next. But the second instance is to transfer anointing or authority. Numbers 27. You were in Leviticus. The next book is Numbers. Numbers 27. Now, do you remember, that those of you that were here last week, remember I said to you, when we were looking at the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that there are two works of the Holy Spirit. Firstly, He comes into us for salvation. Unless a man is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot be saved. So the Spirit of God comes into us, bringing God's life into our spirit, and begins the work of sanctification. That's all of us experience at salvation. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is when the Spirit of God comes upon us for ministry. And we looked at that last week and we dissected it and we see that there are two very separate works of the Holy Spirit. They are not the same. If you weren't here last week, you might not understand it and I encourage you to maybe get the CD or go onto our website and look at this teaching. But I said to you that in the Old Testament... The Spirit of God came upon people. Remember that. All right. Moses was one of them that the Spirit of God came upon. So we look at Numbers chapter 27, and we take up from verse 18. And the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua the son of Nun, take him with you, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. Sets him before Eliezer the priest and before all the congregation and inaugurate him in their sight. And you shall give some of your authority to him that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. And we take out down to verse 23. And so Moses laid his hands on him and on Joshua and inaugurated him just as the Lord commanded him by the hand of Moses. And so Joshua then was inaugurated, or another word, a nice Christian word. He was ordained to take over as the next leader of the nation of Israel. But the, the word authority in verse 20, that is both in the authorized and the New King James, and you shall give some of your authority to him, is an interesting Hebrew word. It's the Hebrew word Hod, H-O with the umla on the O, D, Hod. Now what does Hod mean? It means authority. Actually it doesn't. Both the King James and the, author and the New King James actually translated incorrectly. It's not authority. It's translated, it's, uh, in Hebrew it's either splendor, majesty, Beauty, excellency, honor, or glory. You're right. As I said, I just remembered I looked at this morning. The authorized does say honor. All right. Well, it's actually not a good word. It's excellency, it is majesty, it is glory. Many times, the word hod in the Old Testament is translated glory. You shall take some of the glory that is upon you, Moses, and you shall transfer that glory onto Joshua. Now, it wasn't Moses' glory to give. Remember, it was God's glory because the Holy Spirit was upon Moses. It wasn't Moses to give. Moses did not own it and he had no right to give it. But God told him to. And it's because God told him to, there was a transfer of the glory of the Spirit of God, of the anointing of God that was on Moses' life, and there was a transfer of that onto Joshua. And there's so, many, so much typology. For those of you who like typology in Midrash, <laughs> Moses is a type of the law. Moses could not enter the promised land because the law cannot enter glory. And so the, so the glory goes off the law onto Joshua, whose name in Hebrew is Yeshua. 
It's the same as Jesus. And it's Joshua, the typology of Jesus, who brings them into the promised land. Okay, this is for those of you who like Midrash. You got your, you got your goosebump for the day. Let's move ahead. All right. So we see in the Old Testament that the laying on of the hands was for twofold purpose. To transfer guilt from the guilty party to another party who will then pay for the sin or for, and the second reason, was a transfer of anointing, of authority. And a very well-known example is Elijah the prophet and Elisha. Remember, Elisha asked for a double portion of the anointing that was upon Elijah. And Elijah says, it's not mine to give. Love those words. It's not mine to give. I wish that some Christians would understand that. You know, there's some Christians who go around saying, if you want a prophet's anointing, go to a prophet and they'll lay hands on you. And then you'll get the anointing. You can't get somebody's anointing. It's not yours to give. And so Elijah says to Elisha, it's not mine to give. Nevertheless, if you see me being taken up, then know that God will grant you your request. And so that's what happens. Right. That's the Old Testament. That's the foundation of the doctrine. Why is it important to look at the Old Testament when looking at New Testament doctrines? Pattern, yes, absolutely. Well done, Lorna. Don't be scared. You got that. Nailed it on the head. Well done. You see, many of us, because we come to, to, you know, to, to the Lord Jesus and we come into a particular church denomination, and that becomes our root, our foundation, and our understanding. And then we find out that perhaps some of our teachings are wrong. So some of you have come out of churches where there are teachings that are really bad. And so the natural reaction then is to discard God, everything that you were taught. Yes, it's all or nothing syndrome. And so to then reestablish truth, one needs to go right back to the beginning. So we go back to the Old Testament. We see, we look at things that were in place when God first began to deal with men. And we see that these are spiritual laws. These are spiritual truths that transcend covenant. Salvation has always been by faith in God. The keepers of the law kept the law because they had faith in God. The doctrine of the laying on of hands has got nothing to do with Christianity or Catherine Kuhlman or Kenneth Copeland or Benny Hinn. It's got nothing to do with them. So you can't discard it because you might not particularly like them. A truth is a truth irrespective of who perverts it. And so the doctrine of the laying on of hands is a spiritual law. It is a truth that we find in the Old Testament and we see it carried through to the New. And what we see in the Old is that the Spirit of God upon an individual, in the case of Moses, by instruction of God, and I highlight that, by instruction of God is then transferred upon Joshua, through the laying on of hands. Don't forget through the instruction of God. You and I can't go around and imparting spiritual gifts to people. I will qualify that momentarily. But the doctrine of the laying on of hands is simply a transfer of the charismata the gifts, because that is the Greek word. It sounds a lot like charismatic. You might not like the word charismatic, but the word charismatic is one who functions in the charismata, or a group of believers who believe in the charismata, in the gifts. Don't despise the name because of the connotations. Semantics are incredibly powerful. You all know what the word semantics means. It's the, how words affect perception. A word to somebody might be acceptable, but to another person, the same word brings about very negative connotation. 
The laying on of hands is the transfer of the charismata or the outworking of the charismata from one to another. We're going to see this in the Old Testament, sorry, in the New Testament. Turn with me, if you would, to Mark chapter 6. What is necessary for the doctrine of baptisms to be exercised? Sorry, the the baptism. Let's take baptism out of that sentence, David. What is necessary for the doctrine of the laying on of the hands to be exercised? What is important? Spirit-filled. Absolutely. There can be no transfer of the Holy Spirit upon somebody unless He's upon somebody. Does that make sense? You can't give what you don't got. All right, it's, it's really straightforward. So we look at Mark chapter 6. We all know and understand that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit, which took place at his water baptism at the age of 30. So we go to verse 1 of Mark chapter 6. Then he, speaking of Jesus, went out from there and came to his own country. And his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. If anybody believes that Mary, one child by immaculate uh, conception, then you'll have to explain James, Joseph, Judas, Simon, and all the girls. Verse 4, But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Jesus couldn't do many mighty works at Nazareth except that he laid his hands on a couple of sick people and healed them. Not mighty works. Probably a cold here, a flu there, a splinter in the nail, a bruised foot from where a camel stood. A few works. I mean, no mighty works were done through the laying on of hands. Why was it at Kapanam and everywhere else there were great and mighty miracles that took place through the ministry of Jesus, but when he comes to Nazareth, he couldn't do any mighty works. What hindered him? That's right, verse 6. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about in a circuit teaching. Teaching them what? <laughs> to believe. Now this is starting to sound very charismatic isn't it? Yes, praise God. Babies and bath waters do not need to be separated totally. Sorry, let me, sorry. Let me, scratch that. Babies and bath waters should not be tossed out together. They need to be separated. The faith message is true. Just because it's been perverted by some does not take the truth out of the message. I don't care who's quoted this scripture Recently, in the last 50 years, this scripture has been quoted by the apostles, it was quoted by the fathers of the Pentecostal revival. This scripture is true because it is true. Without faith, don't expect God to move. The faith message is a true message. Just because it's been perverted by some doesn't make the message untrue. Jesus could not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. So if you want to exercise the laying on of hands, at least one party should have some faith. Preferably both. Because Jesus couldn't do many mighty works. He had faith. He had no problem with praying for people. He was quite convinced that the Father would answer his prayers. He had no issue with that. But the people being prayed for didn't believe. Now here's the reality. I've prayed for many, many, many people over the last 29 years of being a Christian. 
Sometimes you lay hands on somebody and you can just kind of feel that there's, it's like laying hands on a stone. I mean, it's like death. And because we're polite, we just mumble the prayer. And we absolutely know that God's going to do nothing. And other people, you, you, you lay your hands on and it's almost like you can just sense a surge just going through you. Now, it's not about feelings. It's not about anything like that. But some people you can just pray for, and there's just like a liberty to pray. And it's, it's just, it's, you feel that something's being drawn out of you. And others, it's like laying your hands on a corpse. Without faith, it's really hard to expect anything from God. Now, there are times that God in His absolute grace and mercy will move. But generally, we need to have faith. Now, so many of us are so scared about the laying on of hands because of all the abuse that we stand up for prayer or we sit down for prayer and say, Dear God, please don't do anything. Please keep the Toronto's blessing away from me. Please don't give me gold teeth. Please don't put gold dust in my hair. Lord, don't make me roll around crying out to the angel Emma. We've got so much paranoia going on in our head that we can't ex receive anything from God. We need to snap out of this delusion. God will give the Spirit to them who ask. If your heart is wicked, you will get from Satan. If your heart is humble and you're sincere, God will minister to you. Please, understand this. God is restoring His church. We thank God for the teachers who have gone before laying down foundations of truth. We appreciate God for their ministry, but they've brought us only so far. They've exposed error. They have not brought us to completeness yet. Until the church is doctrinally sound and full of the Holy Spirit, we are incomplete. God is moving the church forward. We thank God for sound doctrine. We thank God for the people who have labored and have endured much criticism and ridicule in order to establish sound doctrine. But God is moving forward, taking what has been established and building on it, not ignoring it, not laying it aside, but building on it. Precept upon precept, line upon line is how God builds. You and I have got to move forward. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was of God. We cannot turn our back on it because of abuse by some. God is restoring all things. When and why do we lay hands on people under the New Testament? Obviously, we don't lay hands on people to transfer our sin upon them so that they can be sacrificed. <laughs> no matter how tempting that might sound. But does anyone have any ex examples in the Old Testament, where, sorry, in the New Testament, where hands were laid upon people? And for what? Setting apart for ministry, yes. For healing, yes. Anything else? Baptism in the Holy Spirit, correct. Well, let's look at some of these. Healing is quite easy but to see in the Scripture. To get through to some of your heads that are still okay for today is the challenge. In Mark chapter 16, verse 17 and 18, the Lord Jesus, not a Pentecostal preacher or a charismatic or a full gospel, but the Lord Jesus said these words. Mark 16, verse 17. And these signs perhaps could sometimes, on rare occasions, Follow those who believe. Is that the amplified King George? No. These signs, definite article, will. These signs will follow those who believe. Now notice it follows those who believe. 
Those who don't believe get exactly what they believe for. Nothing. These signs will follow those who believe. Are we comfortable? These are the words of Jesus. What signs will follow those who believe? In my name, they will cast out demons. In my name, they will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. The words of Jesus. Now we have to lay aside our prejudice. I don't like seeing certain ministers go through their antics. But that does not nullify the words of Jesus. Jesus said, those who believe, in my name they'll cast out demons, in my name they'll speak with new tongues, in my name, if they drink anything deadly or by no means hurt them, they'll take up serpents by accident, not like some of the crazies in America where they have rattlesnakes in their church services, but like the example is Paul on the island of Malta. We was gathering firewood and there was a viper amongst the branches and the viper bit him and everybody expected him to swell up and die and he didn't. In other words, he wasn't tempting God. You should not tempt the Lord thy God. But it was an accident. Do you want to just help somebody go in there? Thanks. Uh, it was a accident. And so God spared him. Right. So whether we like it or not, brethren and sistren, here is the reality. Laying hands on individuals that they may be healed is biblical. That's what happened in the book of Acts. The apostles laid their hands on individuals and people were healed. Acts chapter 5 Verse 12, the Bible tells us. Acts 5, verse 12, you can take it down. I'm going to go quite quickly. And through the hands of the apostles, many, not some, many signs and wonders were done among the people. What was the result of the hands being laid? What was the fruit of it? The fruit is in verse 14. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes, both of men and women, James, verse five, chapter 5, verse 14. He talks about anointing the sick with oil. Now, believe it or not, that is part of the doctrine of the laying on of hands. Using the oil as a point of impartation. We find in the book of Acts chapter 19, Paul in Ephesus. The Bible says that there were many miracles done by the Apostle Paul. And it says they were unusual. Acts 19, reading from verse 11. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. You see, here's the thing, brothers and sisters, is that God sometimes does unusual things. Not really unusual things. You read the Old Testament and see some of the things he asked his prophets to do. How would you like God saying to you, cut off your garments from the waist and walk around naked? Or how would you like it if God say, right, for a hundred and so many days you're going to lie on your left side? Sometimes God will ask you to do unusual things. Not often. Really. But because something's unusual doesn't necessarily mean it's not of God. That's why we need discernment. And we, why we need the Holy Spirit to discern between God and the devil. We don't go by what we see. We always go by what the Spirit says. But there were unusual miracles because Paul did something unusual. What was that? 
so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. These garments, either an apron or a handkerchief, and that was then taken to an afflicted person, and they were healed, and demons were driven out. This is not unusual, because the Bible says that when Jesus was going to the house of Jairus of Capernaum, that the woman with the issue of blood reached out and touched his, the hem of his garment, and Jesus perceived that power went out of him and she was healed. Why did she even reach out for the hem of his garment? Why did she do such a strange thing? Well, you know, if you know your scriptures, you can give me an answer. The, I'll give you a hint, Malachi. I'll give you another hint, chapter 4. It wasn't because she was tithing. Jerusalem Chronicle, woman gets healed because of tithing. No! Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. And you all look at that and you say, Huh? What's that got to do with her reaching out and touching the hem of his garment? Everything, because the word wings, again, is mistranslated. Because it's the Hebrew word, kanaf. It means the edge of his garment. It is the kanaf. It's the edge of the garment. To the Jews, they understood, because the edge of the garment was where the tzitzit were, the tassels. Sharita and touched the kanaf, the edge of his garment, the tassels, because she knew that he was the son of righteousness, the Messiah. So she touches his clothing and... The anointing of God flows from Jesus through his clothing to the woman. And he stops and he says, Who touched me? And Peter and the rest of the disciples say, You've got to be kidding, right, Lord? You're in the middle of a crowd. Everybody's touching you. This woman wasn't the only person touching him. Let's go to Mark chapter something, verse something. To look at this, I think it's Mark chapter 6. If it's not, it's 5. If not, it's 7. But it's around there somewhere. One day we'll find those two guys who put chapters and verses in there and we'll punish them greatly for confusing us. All right, Mark chapter 5. The Hebrew way, because there were no chapters and verses, it says it is written in the book of Isaiah. It made everyone look smart. Nowadays you've got to quote chapter and verse. It makes us all look like dummies. In Mark chapter 5, the Bible says... In uh, verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, notice what she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I will be made well. Why? Because Moshiach, Messiah, is the son of righteousness who will arise with healing in his tzitzit, in his, the kanaf, in the edges of his garment. It was a messianic prophecy. The Jews were waiting for Messiah. It's faith. If I touch the Son of Righteousness, if I touch Moshiach, if I touch Messiah, I will be healed. Bible, the Bible says in verse 29, Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? Now, saints, I'm, by the grace of God, this church is going to become charismatic. If, if, even if it's me, myself, and I, and the three of us having a Holy Ghost revival, that's fine. But by hook or by crook or by lamb or by bacon, okay, forget the bacon, we are going to be a charismatic church. But when I talk about charismatic, I'm talking about doctrinally sound. I'm talking about with the true evidence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus felt. Let me tell you, saints, faith is not, is not just faith. When you walk by God, there are things you feel. There are things you know that you know that you know. And stop this thing that it's not about feelings. Because you know what? Sometimes it is. Jesus knew that power gone out of him. How did he know? By faith? How do you know when a cookie goes out the cookie jar? Because there's one less.
you know, you sense. And he stops. And he says, who touched my garment? And that's what Peter says, Lord, you've got to be joking. But his disciples said to him, verse 31, you see the multitude thronging you, and you say, who touched me? You see, there's two kinds of touches. Those of you who watch cricket, you see when the batsmen go up to the, you know, to the cloakroom, especially at the Wanderers, they've got to go up the stairs and there's, a, there's a, um, an aisle for them and all the little boys are touching them. You know, they're touching their favorite cricketer because that's what we do, don't we? We want to touch somebody famous. And it's a touch of curiosity. It's a touch of awe. And a lot of people were touching Jesus. I, you know, I touched the Messiah. You know, it's like little kids. It's an inquisitive, curious, or bragging rights. And that's what many of us do with the Lord. We lift up our hands and it's like, here goes, I hope God knows I touched him. But Jesus said, who touched me? Who laid hold of me? Who truly trusted God for something? Do you see the difference? And of course, we know the story. She was healed. So when Paul in Ephesus lays hands on handkerchiefs and aprons, it's exactly what, Jesus, what happened to Jesus. It's what happened with Peter. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts that, he would, that the people would lay the sick down. And he would just walk past in the shadow of Peter falling upon them, would heal them. Because when you are full of the Holy Spirit, there is a hod on your life, the Hebrew word, H-O-D, which is a glory. It is the glory of God. It's not your glory. It's not your power. It's got nothing to do with you. It's all of God. And that anointing, that presence of God can set people free. It's not you. It's got nothing to do with you. And it will lift off you like that the moment you think it's you. And will be replaced by something demonic. And that's what's happened in the church today. When pride comes in, when the sin of Simon the sorcerer comes into the church, then we become sons of the devil, and it's not the anointing of God anymore, but it is a work of darkness that imitates the Holy Spirit. We lay hands. Yes. Good question. Brilliant question. I think you've asked it on behalf of many. Do you all hear the question? If a godly person lays hands on you, there's an impartation of the Holy Spirit, but what happens if an ungodly person lays hands on you, will you get a demonic spirit? The answer is absolutely not. Why? Because Jesus said, what? He said a lot of things. But he said to you, Assuredly, I say to you, he says, no, he says, I'll give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and have all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. So nothing demonic will harm you. The whole thing with Balaam and Israel. Balaam being paid to curse Israel. And he comes and he says, there is no curse over Israel, for I cannot curse that which, that, that which God has blessed. So you and I don't have to fear. Remember, Satan works through unbelief. If we believe that somebody has power over us, that's fine. You know, when the, the whole Rodney Hard Brown Toronto falling thing happened, I went up for prayer. There was probably 100 people in the prayer line. I said, Lord, if this is of you, full me with your spirit. If it's not of you, keep me. And Rodney did his thing and opened my eyes, and everyone was on the ground, and I was standing. Okay. Well, that was to be expected. I'm such a rebel, rebel anyway. No, God is faithful to his people. Please understand that. If we love the Lord, and our heart is toward the God, towards God, we are kept and protected. There's nothing to fear. All right. Laying on of hands for healing. It's biblical, and there are at least three 
expressions of that. It's the physical laying on of hands. Using oil, as James tells us to, if is anyone sick? It's a good portion of Scripture to read. James 5. It says this. If any, is there anyone amongst you sick? Let him call for the elders. Let me say that again. Because this is where pastors get into trouble. Because they don't teach this. And the congregation is then under a delusion. And then gets across the pastors. If anybody's sick, let them call for the elders. doesn't say if anybody's sick, let them assume that the elders know. <laughs> Pastor, I was sick. You didn't come see me. That's because I didn't know. You're supposed to. How? God tells you. <laughs> Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders. And let them anoint him with oil. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. All right, that's the first one. Second one. We looked at last week and it was mentioned this morning to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Remember all the scriptures we looked at last week. That the apostles laid hands on the folk in Samaria and they received the Holy Spirit. Paul at Ephesus and they received the Holy Spirit. Ananias, not an apostle, not a deacon, just an ordinary Believer lays hands on Paul, and he receives the Holy Spirit. So that's the second reason why we lay hands on people, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Third, love these controversial ones. They're actually not controversial, they're quite simple. But they've just been convoluted because of bad teachers. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians Sorry, 2 Timothy, chapter 1 and verse 6. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 6. Is my watch fast? Or is it 7 minutes to, is it seven minutes to 11? All right, praise God, we've got 36 minutes left. And then we're going to go into overtime. We went into overtime last week, and a lot of folk aren't here today. They thought they've done church twice. <laughs> All right, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Paul, encouraging young Timothy, says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Another place. In 1 Timothy, Paul will say to him in 1 Timothy 4, 14, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. That's 1 Timothy 4.14. 4, so both in 1 Timothy 4.14 4, and 2 Timothy 1 verse 6, we see that at some stage, both Paul as well as a presbytery. What is a presbytery? It is a council of elders. So they had laid hands on young Timothy ordaining him into the ministry through the laying on of hands, and God imparted spiritual gifts. Notice the gifts were not declared by the presbytery or Paul. Paul didn't say receive the gift of a bishop. He laid hands upon Timothy, as well as the presbytery at some stage, laying hands on Timothy, and whatever gift God had for Timothy was imparted. Can I show you this in the scripture again? Some, because again, there's this incredibly bad doctrine that if you want a, pro a prophet's anointing, you go to a prophet to pray for you. Remember, as Elijah, who represents the true office of a prophet, said, it's not mine to give. None of us own our anointing. In fact, it's not our anointing. So let me rephrase that. None of us own the anointing that is on our life. It is God's. He gives it, and He will take it away. It's not ours. In the book of Acts, chapter 12, again, a, a portion of Scripture I use very often, because I don't know many. So it's Acts, chapter 13. All 
Right, we'll get, that's a very good question. And I asked the question, is the anointing of God upon you 24-7, or does it just come upon you as God wills? That is a brilliant question. Does anyone know the answer? No, okay, we'll look, find somebody and come back next week. <laughs> no, I'm just pulling your leg. One needs to, when we talk about the charismata, the gifts, the gifts are themselves divided into categories. There are the ministry gifts of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Those gifts are 24-7. They function all the time. An apostle will always be an apostle. You're waking up at, in the middle of the night and you'll still function as an apostle. The teacher will always be able to teach. The prophet will always be able to teach as well. The evangelist will always have an anointing to evangelize. And the pastor will always have a shepherd's heart. Those gifts are 24-7 because they are ministry gifts. The gifts of ministry that God has put in your life are ministry gifts. So gifts of service, whatever the case is, they're there the whole time. The gifts of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, notice these are not ministry gifts. They're the gifts of the Spirit for the edifying of the body are given as He wills for a specific moment, for a specific purpose, and then withdrawn. So you can't say, I have the gift of healing. You don't. What you can say is, it seems that God often will use my vessel in this gift as He wills. You don't live in it, but God might use you. So certain people like the prophet, the prophet will very regularly flow in the gift of discernment, discerning of spirits, tongues and interpretation, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, prophecy. These gifts will function more regularly, but they're not on demand. So you can't go to a prophet and say, give me a word. You know, if he's a true prophet, he'll say, go to sleep. You know, go away. Because they're not, they don't flow. But can he function as a prophet all the time? Yes. Remember, a prophet is there to bring the church in line with God. They can't help themselves. So that gift is always there. Does that answer your question? All right. Acts chapter 13, we see that Paul with the rest of the elders at Antioch are praying and ministering to the Lord. In verse 2 says, as they ministered. Sorry, does that say Acts 12? It's, okay, it is Acts 13. Acts 13, 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to be Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Does the Holy Spirit tell the church what the calling is? He doesn't. He says, separate them to the work to which I've called them. Then what happens is, the Bible says in verse 3, then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. Notice all they did was lay hands on them. They didn't say, receive the gift of the apostle. They just laid hands. It's not for us to determine the gift. In fact, you don't want to go down that road. So if you're going to pray for somebody, say, Lord, whatever the gifts you have for, that indiv for this individual, Father, impart to them your gifts. Fill them with everything they have need of you. It's not for us to determine it. It's definitely not our area of authority. So that's the third purpose for the laying on of hands. First, healing. Second, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you remember last week, you can get baptized with the Holy Spirit by a sovereign move of God. It doesn't have to be through the laying on of hands, but oftentimes it is. The third, for imparting spiritual gifts. And the fourth is ordination. To ordain somebody into the fivefold office. This is something, again, misunderstood. So let's go to 1 Timothy. And we're going to go to chapter 5, and we're going to read from verse 17. It is absolutely important that individuals are ordained into ministry in the sense that they are prayed over, having their gifts recognized by fellow elders. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Now... I'm going to read a few verses to, bring you, to give you the context 
because the verse that we really want to look at is so often misunderstood. So to get the context, we start at verse 17. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. I think we should just stop there and meditate on that and go home. Okay, all right. For those of you who didn't get it, let's move on. For the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox hmm, while it treads out the grain, and the labor is worthy of his wages. Paul is speaking about... That's so funny, really. It's hilarious. <laughs> Just a bit of lateral thinking, you'll get the joke. It's very good. All right, back to the East Rand. He's talking about elders. The elders who labor, the elders amongst you are worthy of honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. And grain, oxen, and muzzling is that a laborer is worthy of his wages. So an elder who, is, who labors full time in the ministry is entitled to an income, uh, preferably not grain. <laughs> Verse 19. Do not receive an accusation against an elder, except from the mouth of two or three witnesses. So what is, who, who is Paul talking about? He's talking about elders. The elders are worthy of honor. They're worthy of a salary if they are laboring. If they're not laboring, send them out to work. He then says if there's an accusation against an elder, because elders aren't perfect. Have you noticed that? If not, just look at me. But you cannot... Receive an accusation against an elder unless there are two or three witnesses. I believe that elders can be rebuked and elders can be disciplined. And they have to be, otherwise they're not accountable. But it needs to be about two or three witnesses. Then, verse 20, those who are sinning, those who? Those people in the church or those elders? What's the context? What's the subject? Elders. So those elders who are sinning, rebuke in the presence of all that the rest may fear. Verse 21. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. What things does he charge you with? Does he charge Timothy with? What's he commanding Timothy about? What's he speaking about? Elders. Don't, have, don't show partiality to certain elders. If the elder that you like is sinning, just because he's your mate, just because you play golf together, you still got to discipline him. Don't show partiality. Now, the mysterious verse 22 is going to make sense. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor in share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. He's still talking about elders. Timothy, don't show partiality. If an elder is sinning, then by the mouth of two or three witnesses, it needs to be brought to the attention of the eldership and they need to be rebuked. Do not lay hands on anyone speedily. Don't lay hands to ordain elders. Don't share in other people's sins. Test them, try them, prove them to know that they are Worthy to stand in the office. Do you see the context? Because a lot of people think you don't lay hands on people because now you're going to share in their sins and the demon's going to come back and jump you. And it's kind of like, what? It's not nothing to do with that. It's about elders. All right. That's as clear as mud. Let's move on. We're nearly done. 25 minutes, Sunday school teachers. We're going to have to start extending the Sunday school because we are going to back, we're going to our. Normal time slot of a two-hour service, and anything over that, we're going to be over time. All right. Not on purpose, but we need to get these things done. Right, now we come to the real humdinger. Slain in the Spirit. dum dum da dum dum da dum dum da dum 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 Oh, here you go. This thing, slain in the spirit, or as I call it, the charismatic backflip. (laughs) 
What does the Bible say? Now, please, I am not insensitive to some of your experiences. I know that some of you have had horrendous experiences. I know that some of you have seen horrendous things. But remember, babies and bathwater need to be separated and only one gotten rid of. Don't throw the baby out of the bathwater is what I'm saying. What is true, we hold on to. What is wrong, we discard. What does the Bible say about being slain in the Spirit, which sometimes is as a result of the doctrine of laying on of hands? Well, firstly, there are three reasons for somebody to go from standing to down on the ground. Actually, there's four. The first is they tripped. In which case, case, make sure that there's no physical damage, where there is apply first aid and for an ambulance. Right, that's not spiritual, that's just stupidity or clumsiness. But there are three reasons why somebody will fall down. The first, and let's just deal in order from bad to good. The first is hypnotic suggestion. Let me explain that. It started with Catherine Kuhlman, who became the instructor of this phenomenon. You and I respond to both conscious and subconscious stimuli, or stimuli, which is the correct pronunciation. It is easy to get people to behave in a certain way, or to anticipate response. Now, if you notice some of your favorite TV evangelists, they create an atmosphere amongst the congregation either by playing a particular song over and over and over again. And while the song is being played, here's a favorite. He touched me. And we all know who sings that one 497 times. And while they're playing the song, he touched me with a very proficient pianist. You hear things like, oh, the Holy Spirit is in this place. He touched me. Oh, today is your day. He touched me. Oh, the people in that side of the auditorium. Oh, the Spirit of God is strong, the Lord says. What does the Lord say? I'm not telling you yet. He touched me. (laughs) And what is happening is you're being induced into a semi-hypnotic state. And then, oh, at the count of three, all you in that section there, yes, not you, you're safe. (laughs) On the count of three, all of you are going to start smiling. Watch. (laughs) One. Don't, not yet. Two. (laughs) Wait for it. On three, a smile. Ready? Three. Look, you're smiling, except you in the front there. Okay. (laughs) That's what's happening. It is a subtle form of hypnosis. God hasn't touched you. It's emotional. You're in a hypnotic state. You're responding to auto-suggestion. That is a door to the demonic. We don't see it in Jesus' ministry. We don't see it in the ministry of the apostles. It is unbiblical. It is unscriptural to play on the emotions of individuals. That is to appeal to the soul which is an abomination to God. We do not create an atmosphere for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not need an atmosphere to move in. That is, I said, from the worst, from the false to the true. People fall because it's auto-suggestion, it's hypnotic uh, suggestion, and it is the right thing to do. Most Christians feel if you don't fall, they haven't received anything from God, so they just do the charismatic backflip. And if you, do, if you want to stand up, then you'll at least have an overzealous elder or pastor pushing you down because some of them think that it's the falling that, that does the work. This is the doctrine of the laying on of hands, not the doctrine of falling. You get it? It's not, we all fall down. Avoid any environment where you are being primed. Repetitive praise and worship for the sake of worship. 
the darkening of an, auditor- of an auditorium, a pastor singing and some lunatic on the organ playing, because this is something that's also coming out from the, the States, and it's been out for a while, where you have the pastor, as he goes, you know, he, he, higher than the, got the guy on the, on the organ, bam, 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 you know, run. Right. The second, people fall because it's purely demonic. The demon in the individual cast them to the ground. Jesus and the epileptic boy. When the boy was brought to Jesus, the spirit convulsed him, threw him on the ground. The man in Gadarene who came to Jesus was full of the, the demon, fell at the feet of Jesus. I have seen this so many times praying for people in the prayer line. I'm praying for somebody here and somebody down there just goes boom. And everyone says, like, wow, this is only anointed, hey? <laughs> no, it's not this act being anointed. It's that demon that is playing dead. You know, some spiders, when they are threatened, will play dead. Some animals will play dead because they think you will leave them alone. And Satan does the same thing. Like the demon will just take the person down and if all the charismatics say, praise the Lord, God is in this place because we're stupid. No, Satan is in that place. And Satan has taken that person and put them down so that we will not minister to them. Okay. Right. I say we're going from the bad to the good. So let's see if there's any cases in the Bible where people did fall in the presence of God. And yes, there are. To name a few, take them down. John 18, verse 6. Those who came to rest Jesus, Jesus said to them, I am, and they all fell backwards. Ezekiel happened to him a number of times. That's John 18, verse 6. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 28. And again in chapter 3, Verse 23, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 28, and Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 23. Ezekiel has a vision, and he says, I became as one dead. Daniel 8, verse 18. My strength left me, and I became as one dead. Acts 26, verse 14, Paul recounting his conversion experience on the road to Damascus, all those around me fell to the ground. Revelation 1, verse 17, John, on the Isle of Patmos, on the day of the Lord, said, I became as one dead. What has happened to these individuals? The physical body could not stand in the presence of a holy God. Yes, but David, that's got nothing to do with laying hands on people because you're not the holy God. Well, praise the Lord. You've you've worked that out. That's awesome. That's a good step forward. But it's the Holy Spirit that is upon us. Jesus sensed the power, the dunamis, that was upon him, leave him and go from him. There is a reality that there are times when the power of God comes upon you and your physical body cannot literally stand in the presence of God. And it's like all your strength has been sapped out of you. I am not emotional as a believer. I don't respond to emotion. I do not respond to people's expectations of me. So I don't fall over. But there have been times where the power of God has come upon me and I haven't been able to move. I've literally not been able to move. So, there are times when the power of God comes upon you where the body cannot stand. 
if this is an issue for you, sit and be prayed for. But it's not about falling. The doctrine is a doctrine of laying on of hands. It's an, it's an impartation of the Spirit of God that is transferred from one person to another for the sake of ministry. That's all it is. It's not the doctrine of we all fall down. Do you understand this? Remember that with every doctrine, Satan comes in to pervert. Think about all the doctrines we've covered. The doctrine of salvation. How has Satan come in to pervert that? It's not by faith anymore. It's by faith and works. The doctrine of faith toward God. How has that been perverted? Well, the whole word of faith movement is a perversion of the doctrine of faith. It now becomes the power of positive confession, visualization. It's a perversion. The doctrine of baptisms has been so perverted. All four baptisms have been perverted. The baptism of the body of Christ has been perverted. Water baptism has been perverted. On dwipni, on sprinkle. It's a perversion. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a, has been perverted. It's not for today. Or you get baptized in the Holy Spirit when you come to salvation. The baptism of suffering has been perverted. We're king's kids. We're overcomers. We never suffer. Every doctrine that is a elementary principle, a foundation fundamental of the Christian faith has been attacked by Satan. And now we're looking at the doctrine of the laying on of hands. How has it been perverted? Because we're all focusing on the let's all fall down syndrome. And so we stand like this. All right, pray for me, pastor. I'm ready. Well, as James said, let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. Do you see how perversion robs truth? It's not about falling. In fact, let's all pray for each other sitting down. But is there impartation when we pray for one another believing? Yes. Do the gifts of the Spirit sometimes flow when we pray for each other this way? Yes, they do sometimes flow. This is a fundamental doctrine of Christianity, that you and I who are priests of God have been called of God to minister one to another in the area of healing, impartation of gifts, ordination, Baptism of the Holy Spirit. What about encouragement and blessing? Going back to the Old Testament. Because the Jews would bless each other. The fathers were commanded to lay hands on their children and impart a blessing. God said to Moses, You'll tell Aaron in this way you shall bless Israel. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord sanctify you. Even in traditional churches, you'll see the pastor, the father, the or the Dwemer, he's standing up, and he'll recite the ironic blessing with his hands outstretched. This is biblical. And you and I need to get over our phobias and trust God. If a wicked man will give his son a fish, when he asks for a fish, when he gives him bread instead of a stone, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them who ask? You and I have got to get over this irrational fear. Because it is irrational. When we come before a, our heavenly Father and we ask Him for what He has, in His Word, promised us, we will get what He has promised us and we will get nothing else. God is not going to give us a demonic spirit when we ask for the Holy Spirit. But if you want it, if you want Joel's pub, you'll get that. You know what I'm saying? Those of you who know anything about the Torrent of Blessing, every false move of, every false move, every move of, of Satan has come into the church because the Christians were not asking for the Lord. They were asking for an experience. Don't seek an experience. Seek God. All right. Praise the Lord. Now, it's 20 past.